Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome tonight's guest moderator, NYU Humanities Chair Lawrence Weschler, and tonight's guest, Ricky J. So, Ricky, uh, can you talk a little bit about this film? It's been a long time in the making, right? Uh, it has, and, and I'm very pleased. Uh, I've been hearing you talking about it for years and years and years. Um, that's probably because it's uh, the process in which it's been made is getting close to 14 years now. So <laughs> there's a reason I've been doing that. But we're, we're all very happy it's been uh, finished, and we're excited about it. Mm -hmm. I'm excited because it, it shows... Um, my mentors, which really makes me happy. I mean, I, I grew up in a world um, inhabited by some of the great magicians and jugglers and ventriloquists of the day because they were friends of my grandfather. Can you talk about your grandfather for a second? I mean, that, that, that's one of the key things in the film is getting, to, getting this sense of his role in your life. Yeah, he, he was um, an immigrant from Austria-Hungary who came over quite young in his life and became fairly accomplished. He was uh, a CPA in a New York firm, uh, having never gone to college, which is uh, almost impossible. He actually uh, got his CPA through an act of Congress that was very briefly uh, allowed at one point of his life. And he became you know, quite successful at that. And he took his pleasure from learning various, various skills and games and techniques that interested him. And the way he did that was to go out and take lessons. So he became interested in billiards and took lessons from Willie Hoppy, who even today is considered one of the greatest people to have ever played the game. And he took tennis lessons from Tommy Ryan and Tommy Wiswell and wrote the introduction to Tommy Ryan's book on checkers. And he became a cryptographer and became the cryptography editor of a magazine. And uh, all these things were done, became interested in mathematical recreations and studied that. And at the period that I was growing up, uh, he had gotten interested in magic. It was one of the last things that really interested him. But he took lessons from the greatest people in the world. And he would take you along occasionally? Or how well, old were this you at was, this stage? This was right before, I suppose, I came along. So by the time I did, by the time I was four, I had met Di Vernon. Uh, this was in Brooklyn. We were living in Brooklyn. Uh, and Vernon was living in Manhattan, and he was a Canadian, but he was considered by almost everyone the greatest sleight of hand artist alive. And Charlie also? At the well, Charlie Miller was uh, not a resident of New York. I didn't meet Charlie until I moved out to California, and I moved to California because Di Vernon had preceded me and also moved to California. At this point, I must have been in my 20s. Okay, but, 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 but so... Do you think that Guy, that Guy Vernon was, was impressed with you at the age of four in any, in any particular way? Or? <laughs> he would have been out of his mind if he well, was I'm, I'm just trying impressed to get a sense of what, 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 ki of what kind four. of four-year-old were you at that I, point? I was a terrible four-year-old magician, as almost anyone would have been at the age of four. Um, but he was willing to give you the time of day? Well, I, I would only meet him occasionally then. But by the time I was uh, 12 or 13... There, there actually was some relationship. I mean, I do recall and still have books which he signed to me at, with, with inscriptions that must have shown I had some promise at that, uh, by that How old age. was your grandfather when you died, when he died? How old were you when your grandfather died? Oh, how old was I when my grandfather died? I think about 17. So he would have begun to see you as, as a magician? My grandfather? Well, he urged me never to do magic uh, for a career. Um, <laughs> So he must have understood he wanted you to be by a that CPA? point, at that point, that I was very interested in it. Well, most of the people in my family seem to have been accountants, which may explain why I had so much trouble with my family. I, uh... It occurred to me we might take a look at one section of the film, uh, the one about misdirection, because it starts with your grandfather, but it also gives a real flavor of the film, and I thought it would be Sure, I'd be happy. Yeah. So many things that are come from that. You know the whole thing about the basketball thing with the... Oh, the, the gorilla? Yeah. yeah. De describe that, because it, it, it's pertinent here. Well, there's a very famous uh, test done by some neuroscientists um, in which you're asked... Uh, there are a number of people in a video. It's, uh, it's, it's certainly available on YouTube. I'm yeah. blanking at the moment on the scientists who invented it, and that's awful because 
they should be lauded for having done this. I think a lot of people uh, uh, claim credit for this uh, afterwards. But the idea is that you're asked to notice the amount of times a basketball is passed in the uh, rather short video that so you're So you are watching. watching a video, and that is the test. Correct. You're right. watching a video, and you're supposed to count the number of times a basketball has passed through the 20 or so people that inhabit this video. And people have, they've been doing this in, in, in labs, in, in labs and asking students uh, to count the number uh, of times the ball has passed, and most of them do. And there's some little variance in the times the ball has passed, but almost no one notices that a person in a complete gorilla outfit is in the middle of this video. I mean, a person literally walks into this video dressed from head to foot as a gorilla. And waves at people. And waves at people and moves in and out, and people do not see it. I wonder if it had been a nude woman. That's a great question, if it had been a nude woman. One of the things I love about uh, Molly Bernstein and Al Al Alan Edelstein, who made this film, is that they somehow found these shots of Abra Lamarck with this nude woman. I have not, I mean, that to me is as mystifying as anything I've ever done. Talk I mean, about misdirection. I guess. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Pretty great. In terms of, uh, what are some of the other things that excited you that they found in the film? Well, I, I guess uh, the footage of a number of people um, whom I, I was unaware of uh, existing on film, or at least the specific pieces of film that they found. And then they, they found people that, that, I did, that I did sleight of hand for. They found a martial arts instructor that I had, that I had um, worked out with 20 years before who, who had moved thousands of miles away, uh, who comes in and then explains a piece that, that I did on film. And I, I mean, they were great, I mean, in putting together Actually, all of Actually, could you tell that story of what he explained, what he says you did? Can I, without giving away the film? Yeah, I, I guess, because I'm not actually doing the effect on film, but um, I've always been interested in the martial arts. Strangely enough, a lot of people I know who do sleight of hand have at some point been interested in the martial arts, and, and I did taekwondo for years and some judo. Is that partly self-protection after blowing people's minds? You just have to get, be able to get out? <laughs> well, I, I would just think it's awfully dangerous to be uh, breaking bricks with your hand. I mean, I, I was actually silly enough to have done that at one point in my life, and um, thank God I got over that. But anyway, you were, doing, you were taking well, martial arts? Well, at this arts. particular uh, time, I was taking Aikido, and um, I, I met this man who taught uh, Zen archery and, and Aikido in Santa Monica, California. He was a sheriff in Santa Monica, California. And I had at an Aikido demonstration at one point uh, asked, so some people came up to me and asked me if I would do an effect. And I said, can I borrow a dollar? And a person handed me a dollar and then a second person handed me a dollar. So I rather befuddledly uh, took the two dollars and did a, a motion with them. And when they looked back, instead of two single dollar bills, I had one two dollar bill, which I handed out to them and let them struggle with how to divide it. And the story of this obviously at some point reached this instructor, but it was many months later. And after... Um, after we had finished a, a workout or a demonstration, I was in the shower, and the sheriff came up to me and handed me $2 bills. I was literally dripping wet in a shower. And he said, let's see you do that now. And I did. And then when they found him, they found that he had been carrying this $2 bill in his wallet for 20 years. I mean, ever since this had taken place. So, they, I, I mean, I was quite stunned that they found him, and he was in Montana or, I mean, somewhere. I mean, I had lost track of him uh, 19 years before. So. I must say, one of the things about the film, and it's also just generally speaking, the, in this genre, that, and I would even say this about a lot of what you do, the stories of what you do are, as told, the look on the people's faces as they tell the story, the look of, of their lives, of their minds having been blown for the rest of their lives. Is, is one of the most striking things. It's almost, when you talk to people who've, who've witnessed your pieces, it's true, for example, of the Mark Singer profile of you in The New Yorker. To read the accounts of people 
telling stories about what you did is almost as astonishing as, as actually witnessing it. It just leaves such a feeling of stupefaction that it communicates to people. Well, I, I hope I can transcend to the point in my life where I actually never do anything again and just <laughs> tell stories about it. <laughs> that would truly be meet the magician. Meet, 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 meet the magician. Maybe that's the origin of Christianity, for that matter. <laughs> People just keep telling stories about that guy who came through. But um, talk a little bit about your. Uh, I mean, one of the great joys in my life has been going to your place and just seeing the 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 archive of books and so forth, and what what that comes from in you. The the interest in. in I, I think initially I started, um, you know, hanging out with other young people interested in sleight of hand in New York. Uh, it, it became clear that if you went to a magic shop, everybody was pitching the newest effect that had been invented and marketed. And I think pretty early on, I, I, I came up with uh, the realization that I didn't want to be doing what everyone else was doing. So I'd either try to come up with my own material, or it actually made some sense to look backwards instead of forwards. And I think that's why I started getting into looking at old books. I was actually looking for material. And then I became, through that, incredibly interested in the history of sleight of hand and then of other eccentric entertainers. You know, why uh, did I ever uh, seek information on Daniel Wildman? That I don't know. Um, I know, okay, who I'll is buy. Daniel Wildman? He was... Uh, at this point, we can let you interview yourself. You keep going. <laughs> <laughs> he was an 18th century circus artist who rode standing up on the back of a horse in a circus rink while five swarms of bees surrounded his face. And he would be handed a glass, and when he brought the glass to his lips, the bees would move away, allowing him to drink the wine. Or he would make the bees alight on a hat chosen by a woman in the audience. I mean, he had complete control. But I, I'm guessing he probably was uh, the only um, the only uh, equine ap apiarist of his day, so uh, <laughs> I became incredibly interested in him and uh, have actually managed to get some pieces, uh, you know, contemporary pieces. Who else have you been thinking about today? Today, um, today, I, I, my thoughts passed on Datus, uh, who had a vaudeville act in which he answered any question asked to him, basically. Um, following it by the phrase, am I right, sir? He was a gas pipe fitter in London who became a hit on the vaudeville stage. Oh, and anyone who ever saw the great Hitchcock film, The 39 Steps, might recall that character that was based entirely on this, this real man, who, whose real name was W.J.M. Bottle. And um, he was a, a savant of an unusual kind. So. I know you also were thinking about S.J. Perelman. I was thinking about S.J. Perlman. Um, I was thinking about S.J. Perlman. I, I was at the Antiquarian Book Fair the other day and saw a remarkable collection of more than 900 wanted posters of various criminals. And I'm interested in the wanted posters of swindlers and con men. And one of the, uh, the posters featured uh, the, the headline, Badger Game. And a number of people came up to me and asked me what the Badger Game was. And it, it was a, a version of a scam in which a, a woman went into a hotel room with a man. Uh, the man made sure he locked the door. And then moments later, someone would appear in the hotel room. Uh, and that seemed very improbable. There were two ways this was done, one with a false panel in the door. And then it was called a panel game as well as a badger game. And the other way in which a gentleman had just been given an extra key in that case, the man would usually announce that he was the husband and shake down uh, the man in the room for money uh, against the fear of exposure or worse. In the panel game, sometimes a man would actually creep into the room and riffle through the pants of the gentleman who now was uh, devoid of them and then sneak back out of the room again. So seeing that uh, reminded me that many years ago, S.J. Perlman, the wonderful, uh, the wonderful humorist and great American writer, in an introduction to uh, Thomas Burns' uh, Professional Criminals of America, 
wrote about the three things he didn't accomplish that he would have loved to. One was that he never got to meet James Joyce because on his way to the meeting, a manuscript of uh, his latest book was left in a taxi cab. The second was that he never got to meet Eileen Pringle, the actress whose voluptuous balcony he had admired for years. And that the third, he was never a, a, a crime reporter for a great New York daily. Do you that have was the that thought you, of the day. What, what, if you were asked the same question. I think I would say those same three things. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we? Um... Well, I, I just have one more question before I want, want to go to the people. But just sitting here at Apple, have either you or have you heard of any new magic effects that require digital uh, things that can be done with iPhones or iPads or things like that? Oh, there actually are a number of people doing some very interesting things. Like what? Uh, um, well, there's a German fellow who, who seems to be very good at showing images on iPads and then taking them out of, uh, taking them out of the iPhone or, or the iPad. I, I think you can find him on YouTube. I, oddly enough, don't remember his name, but he's quite good. And, and as quickly, uh, one of the things about the, the modern day and age is the second someone appears with an original idea like that, there are many people imitating it and doing it not as well. But this one And, and then two days later, it actually is one of the Apple apps. Well, I suppose that's possible as well. But, but uh, this one fellow, and unfortunately, uh, I don't uh, speak German, so I, I don't know his pattern, but it's very clear he's working something like a trade show, a professional engagement, and doing some very, very nice things with that. Have you thought of doing anything with Apple, sir? Um, or no, <laughs> I haven't. I'm still, uh, I'm still a Luddite uh, technologically. I mean, I can get uh, around on these devices and, of course, have all of them and use them, but uh, not to the point of creating original, uh, original effects. <laughs> well, why don't we go out, out here? Yeah, right over here. What's the, the most impressive uh, sleight of hand you've ever seen, and what's the hardest thing you've ever tried to do and weren't able to accomplish? They're both good questions and both hard to answer. Uh, in terms of, of uh, going through my whole life and trying to pick out the single best effect I've seen is difficult because I've been fortunate enough to see many. Uh, in terms of the difficulty of something I've never been able to accomplish, um, there's so many it seems to me that I've been unable to accomplish that I'm not sure. I can answer that uh, either. So I'm afraid this is uh, going to be unsatisfying. Choose one. Um, oh, my partner, uh, Michael Weber, he and I have a, a company called Deceptive Practices that, that uh, consults on, on magic and con games and deception for films and theater and television. We're working on the uh, Houdini musical with Hugh Jackman as Houdini at the moment, for instance. But I once saw their, him. Their slogan is "Magic on a Need to Know Basis." Oh, that, that's true. The the, uh, the 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 slogan of deceptive practice, yeah, is magic, uh, arcane magic on a need to know basis. <laughs> but, um, so you were saying uh, that something that it's actually arcane knowledge that's on right, a need yeah. to know basis. Right. But thanks for taking me down that path, right? Okay. <laughs> so but anyway, coming back to to. Oh, so uh, anyway, my my partner once, and I don't know if this uses comic. Uh, superhero strength or uh, incredibly clever misdirection, but I once saw him pick up a piece of coal and squeeze it between his two hands, and when he opened his hands, uh, there was a diamond there. Well, that was awfully lovely. So that, that, that comes to mind right at the moment. So. Awfully lovely. Any other questions? This is uh, for the magician. Has, uh, has any trick have you ever tried ever hurt you? Um, trick ever hurt me? Well, I mean, I've, I've managed to uh, come up with some odd calluses from, uh, <laughs> from practicing a certain thing for too long. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm probably more well known for an effect I do which hurts others, and that's that I'm able to throw playing cards uh, with some serious accuracy at more than 90 miles an hour. And um, to say that it, it, that has drawn blood is a mild understatement. Um, actually, I was doing that in Tomorrow Never Dies, the James Bro uh, Bond film with Pierce Brosnan, 
I played uh, Henry Gupta, the father of techno-terrorism, <laughs> of course, and uh, a part written for a 25-year-old Indian man. And, and I uh, was asked to throw a card at Pierce Brosnan, and I was told someone was going to come in front of him and block the card. And I explained to uh, Roger Spotswood, the director, that these things were coming very fast and accurately, and it would be very hard to block one. And they wanted to give it a try anyway. And <laughs> I said, sure. And the first time we did this, I threw the card, I guess from here about as far away as, um, as where uh, Steve is on that wall, and hit Pierce right over the eye with the playing card. Needless to say, that was the last time I threw a card at Pierce. I mean, I almost single-handedly ended the career of, of the most successful franchise in the history of film at the time. <laughs> and uh, on one of the DVD extras, uh, that story is told, and there actually is some footage of that. But uh... Hi, Mr. J. I've seen your performances. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, Mr. Weschler kind of hinted on this. I'm curious if you've read events in history, whether Old Testament or non-religious events, where you could somehow, as a master musician, master magician, excuse me, trace it to some sort of magic. In other words, history being wrong, and you suspect that oh, that's... that the, an event was a conjured event and not what people thought. And it's great. It's a really interesting question. I, I, I would say the first thing that comes to mind is rather than actually a magic effect, something that you might analyze as a fraud um, that, that, uh, that might have taken place ra rather than, than an actual trick. Um, but um, yeah, I, 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 what, what would make sense? Um, there's a, actually a whole book of, of them that, that, that's really wonderful. The, uh, um, Mackay, uh, the madness of crowds. What yeah, is the the the, man, uh, the madness of crowds and the wisdom. Uh, Extraordinary popular delusions and the madness, and the madness of, crowds. of crowds. Exactly. Which is, I think the first uh, illustrated edition is 1852, which deals with a lot of things like um, um, the Mississippi bubble and the tulip uh, the tulip Tool scandal. Maybe. There was one point where tulip buds were selling for so much money that it almost brought down the entire government of the Netherlands. And there have been things that just clearly were based on, uh, on fraud and subterfuge. Uh, this question is for Ricky. Um, for lack of a better term, who is your favorite magician? Well, I, I think that uh, currently or, or ever? Cur currently living at this moment. Ah, well, there, there are a couple that come to mind. Um, if, if you don't mind me being uh, loose enough to have more than just one. There's a marvelous Spaniard named Juan Tam Tamarez, who, who's just brilliant. And uh, there's a, a terrific Argentinian named Rene Levand. Uh, I'm very fond of Michael Weber, as I mentioned. There's a, a great coin magician who lives in New York named David Roth. And, and there's always, it seems, this influx of new and, and interesting people coming up. So Can you describe one or two effects sounds, that, they, that they do? Um, the well, Spaniard? I, again, uh, well, he, he has such an enormous repertoire. He's actually the most famous magician in this country, which is quite extraordinary to be the best and, and most well-known. Uh, I'm not sure that that's happened anywhere. <laughs> uh, Rene may be easier uh, uh, to describe in terms of uh, one rather interesting attribute that he's so good you might not even notice this for a moment when he's talking to you. Uh, he tells, he weaves these wonderful poetic stories in Spanish, a language which I do not understand at all, and yet I've been in tears watching him tell stories uh, originated by Borges or Garcia Lorca. I, I should also admit I'm often in tears at reruns of Gilligan's Island, so I'm not sure I'm the standard for this. But, but absolutely poetic events while he's doing extraordinary card magic. And perhaps only later do you realize he's never taken his left hand out of his pocket, and the reason is because he has no left hand. So that's, that's What's his pretty name? significant. Rene Lavand. Wow. Okay, well, I just, I just wanted uh, perhaps... Um, 
Mr. J to, f to follow up on the concept of alchemy and modern magic and maybe how the two things interconnect and, you know, the relationship. I, if you can think of an example. Well, I, actually, I, I, it happens I can. Um, what's fascinating, and this, this comes back to some of the work I did with David Hockney, who was able to show that artists all the way back to Van Eyck were using incredible uh, lenses and so forth, but there was no evidence. You couldn't find it anywhere. I mean, there was no written evidence of it. Uh, there was all kinds of evidence in the painting itself, but there was no written, and the reason was because in those days, uh, people like Giordano Bruno, a few uh, hundred, uh, a few decades later, are still being burned at the cross and the first major book um, in magic in the English language, Scott's Discovery of Witchcraft, from 1584, was basically written by Reginald Scott, a justice of the peace and a knowledgeable man, to say one of the things, the points that he made in this book, was that the performances you would see of itinerant street performers doing sleight of hand was that they were not witches or guided by demons, but rather skillful men. So there's always been this, uh, this strange and interesting relationship. Of which I give you one example right here. And I give you another. 